everyone. Welcome to Thirsty Thursday. We are so excited to have all of you here for this super fun, just in time for the holidays, rethinking boxed wine. Yeah, as if we haven't been drinking enough edition. already this year. Yeah, the holidays. <laughs> now it's the holidays. <laughs> um, we are thrilled to have with us here Jack from Unit Wines. Give us a wave. Hi, everyone. And then also our kind of co-host, Philip Dobard, who is with the Center for Culinary Culture out in LA. We are partnering with them as well. Yeah, for those of you who are joining for the first time, I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cast. We are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like Unit Wines that we're so excited to share with you tonight. Thrilled, yeah. And, and my name is Evan. I'm a certified sommelier, a certified cider professional, uh, mixologist, uh, whiskey enthusiast, uh, equal opportunity craft beer drinker. Um, and uh, for the last 10 years, I've been doing bespoke wine tours up in Napa and Sonoma. Um, and then when the pandemic started, uh, joined forces with Suzanne and began uh, hosting these fun virtual experiences where I still got to continue sharing my passion and appreciation uh, for wine and all things craft alcohol. So thrilled to be here with you tonight to discuss these delicious wines from Unit. Um, and as you get settled in, uh, please let us know where you're joining from, um, what you're sipping on, and uh, if you wouldn't mind taking the poll that uh, popped up there, we'd, uh, we'd love to know a little bit about your feelings regarding boxed wine uh, as we aim to maybe recalibrate them a little bit this evening. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, we love for this to be interactive. So if you're joining and you don't have your camera on currently, we'd love to see your smiling faces or your uh, frowning faces or whatever you have going on. If it's a no shower day, it's okay. It's 2020. Most days are no shower days. Um, if, you the pajama have, day. if you have kids running around, that's okay. We're all friends here. So yeah, we would love to um, kind of hang out and feel like it's more of a party, which is what we really enjoy yeah, about these Thursday night events. If you will. Um, and with that in mind as well, please feel free to unmute yourselves, jump in and ask us questions, throw questions in the chat. We want this to be your time. We can all talk about wine and boxed wine ad nauseum. Um, <laughs> and we're happy to answer any questions, but you know, we're gonna give Jack some space to tell us his story. And then we wanna hear your thoughts, your experiences, all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're gonna chat for, we'll be up here for about 60 minutes. Um, and you know, we'll chat a little bit about boxed wine in general and maybe kind of alternative types of packaging um, and their, their presence in the market now and maybe what it was like 10 years ago and how things maybe have kind of changed and why that is. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of jump in and start tasting and then share some time here with Jack as we go through the tasting, uh, talking about the wines specifically that we're featuring tonight being the Sauvignon Blanc uh, and the Pinot Noir. Um, all the while uh, asking or answering questions and, uh, and addressing any comments that you might have either live or in the chat. So please yeah, feel free to engage with us however you feel most comfortable. And we'd love to see, throw in the chat maybe where y'all are joining from. It's always fun, especially in this time where none of us can travel and we're all stuck. I got an uncle our, that lives there. Yeah, same spaces. We'd love to know where you're joining from. Um, and maybe, you know, if you've had any experience with boxed wine as well. I know we asked it in the poll. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it looks like right now I'm looking at the poll results. Looks like about 41% of you love boxed wine. Awesome. 6% not sure yet. Another 41% is like some good, some bad. That's probably a reasonable stance. Yep. 6% um, not a fan and 6% have never had boxed wine before. So All yay, right. first right. experience for you. Um, and about 30% have had unit wine before. So thank you for coming and supporting Jack if you've already, if you've already had his wine. You know wines. there's a good thing to support here, isn't there? Man, yeah, oh man. for sure. Um, and we know that too. So we have a funny story. You know, we've been doing these virtual tasting experiences for, I guess, since the pandemic yeah. started, really. Um, and, you know, we always get the craft alcohol shipped to us in advance so we can try it and taste it and make sure it's up to our standards and we understand it before we agree to do these events. And we had to embarrassingly kind of go back to Jack and be like, so we ran out of the boxed mm. wine. <laughs> we know we sent it, you sent us two boxes of it. Thank you for obliging us. <laughs> but could we get two more? <laughs> and that's not, honestly never happened. It really, it's, it's surprising that it hasn't. Yeah, with spirits um, But I think cider. it's just that it's, it's open. You can't see how much is 
in there, how much you've already consumed. So you keep kind of being like, I'm sure there's another glass in there. I'm sure there's another glass in there. And you just keep pouring it. And that's one of the things that honestly, I mean, those of you who know us, you know, we both work in craft alcohol. We have plenty of craft alcohol in our house. He's a sommelier. He's been doing bespoke wine tours for, you know, 10 plus years. So we have a wine pro with us here as well. And we have a lot of good wine in the house, but there's just something really nice about having a good wine in the house that is also on tap. Yeah. So that I could just, you know, some nights you don't want to necessarily decide like what bottle to open, what you're doing. So I would just turn to Evan and be like, you want a glass of red? And just go to the fridge and pour my red. Yeah, they became kind of our default house red and house white wines. And yeah. it was a real treat. And I, I had even a hard time saying that because for, you know, the years that I worked in the restaurant world, the house white and the house red kind of, that, that they kind have of, a negative like a pejorative too, kind of right. term to it, but it really was a, a, a real treat. A revelation. Yeah. yeah, for sure. The Crafty Cask House Red and White would never yes, be. Yes, that's right. It's, poor it's a different standard. <laughs> that's right. Um, so with that, does anyone, before we kind of jump in here, oh, we have Arizona, Seattle, Pasadena, Los Angeles, Colorado, Ohio. Ohio. Cool. Awesome. I, w- I would like Kansas to say, a, I would like to say a few words about, about boxed wine. Yes, please um, do, Philip. Hello, everyone. Philip Dobard, president of the Center for Culinary Culture, uh, uh, co-presenter of tonight's tasting. Um, I've been a fan for some years, um, um, six six years now at least. Uh, at when I first was, you know, when I first heard of it, I said, "Oh, come on, come on." Um, but which is, you know, a lot of wine drinkers have that response. For sure. But once I tried it, um, I was converted. Uh, big fan since then. And since that time, we've seen more and more bigger brand quality recognized wines available in boxes. And I think what, and case in point, um, and I think, uh, I think perhaps from a supplier perspective, with the consumer not knowing how much is left, that's kind of a beautiful thing. Oh, that's a good point. It, it, it kind of induces panic. Yeah. yeah. Whoops, that was my last <laughs> glass. I didn't realize. <laughs> you can't ration it out. All of a sudden, it's just gone, and you got to get more. Well, that's, that's right. one of the fun things, too, that Jack will talk about, I'm sure, is they've kind of designed their box wine program to almost be like a subscription program a little bit so that you don't have to think about it, and you get your next box, and you kind of keep replenishing, mm-hmm. which is genius. And I don't know if there's a lot of box wines companies doing that necessarily, so... Um, well, yeah. I know you guys were mentioning that you really felt like it just made sense as as your house wine. Um, and kind of the way people normally think about their house wine, it's like, okay, it's it's the it's the cheapest kind of thing you got. But I mean, to me, if 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 I could have the choice between having a nice wine with some regularity, and and a not so nice wine i you know i i would like to have wine that i love on tap that's my house oh, wine right. um oh, right. and that, that's how it really fits into these club programs <clears throat> and it, it goes along with our whole mission um and and we're really trying to make great wine more accessible and what's more accessible than on tap in your fridge for sure yeah seriously so for those of you who aren't familiar, we left one of our new boxes closed on purpose because let's kind of maybe show you how this works a little bit. I'm gonna spotlight you here for a minute. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like when it arrives. And then you kind of just pull the little Bust cap that right out of there. And then you're gonna open this guy and you don't wanna completely remove this because that actually helps to stabilize the nozzle. So you want to pull that out and kind of get the little edges right, right there. Right past it, the cardboard. There you go. And then you can kind of pop that cardboard back in place. And it doesn't get all loosey-goosey and wiggle around. And then you start trying to pour yourself a glass and you pour it all over the floor of the kitchen. And then uh, you'll just want to peel this part off. It goes right around the backside. And then easy breezy, all you got to do here Don't worry, there's a glass underneath this. (laughs) Just put it right down into your glass. And then this this fits in most refrigerator uh, doors. It really could not be easier. 
Could not yeah. be easier. Yeah, it's awesome. And they do um, cans as well, which are great for when you're out kind of traveling and moving around. Mm -hmm. And also as part of their kind of sample program. So Jack was kind enough to do a really nice sample program um, as well, where you can just get some of these cans for like, I don't know, Jack, it's like less than 20 bucks or something, right? So less than 15 even, I think, to get just to try it. And the wine in the can is the same as the wine in the box. So you know, and a lot of people freak out with cans because then they like people try to drink it out of the can and they're like, it's not the same. Pour it in a glass because yeah. the glass does have an experience. You can you don't course, drink the wine out of the bottle either. Right. Pour it out. <laughs> and like, of course, if you're hiking or camping, drinking it out of the can is fine, but it does make a big difference with that mental perception of like, what kind of wine am I drinking when your lips are touching a can versus right. when they're touching a wine glass? Or Jack, if you're how, hiking, Jack camping, how many? Pour it in I'm a sorry. Wine. How, how many pours are in a are, are in a can? Jack. There, there's one good pour in a can. So okay. it, it's a glass of wine, but it's a it's a good pour. Uh, a yeah. little over six ounces. Very good. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, so that, that size is uh, commonly referred to as a split. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For those of you who are uh, interested in like the names of different sizes. Yeah, I think a lot of people were obviously fascinated with when they'd go on wine tours and they'd see these giant bottles, but conversely, the small ones have have fun names too. The one thing we're pretty excited about about the cans is that I mean look no, no matter what format your your you've got your wine in it's 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 the same you know you can put any quality of wine in there um so really it, it, it's just really simply a perception thing but the the purpose and and the advantage and benefits of of using these other formats um, we talked briefly earlier about having an on tap in your fridge, and that's the best way to do house wine. It's also the most cost effective and most environmental way to do wine. Uh, there's, yeah. there's really a <laughs> when you when you take it, bottles out of the process, it it removes the need to recycle all of them, and that puts a lot of furnace emissions into the atmosphere, which is the air we're all breathing, which is you know. Ultimately, I don't know if you've looked into environmental stuff, but it, it really is a big part of, of healing our, our effect on the planet. Um, but also, so that's the environmental side of things. The cost effectiveness stuff is really obvious. I mean, think about a glass bottle versus a thing of plastic that like can fold down to like a sheet of paper. Like it, it's just really, really obvious. It's really environmental, but but for the cans in particular, what makes that exciting is, yeah, you, you can take it, like you mentioned earlier, up, up a mountain and, you know, go on a hike with it or bring it out to picnics or, or you name it. it it's just so portable. It, it's so accessible. So it makes, it makes great wine accessible kind of wherever you're going because they're so bringable. But, but the awesome thing that we think it enables in terms of making great wine more accessible in addition to being able to bring it to all these different places is that we can put it in the mail for for much less than you would have to put a bottle in the mail for yeah for so, sure so so that enables us we we you're you're mentioning that sample program that that we're offering right now um, it's lowered the cost of, of shipping, which is a huge problem in the direct to consumer um, online wine market. Um, and it, and heavy. It, what's that? Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. Glass is heavy. Glass is heavy in particular. Glass is heavy. There's breakage. So there's more insurance. It just yeah. takes up more space. You have to use those bottle protectors. There's, there's all these things contributing to the cost of shipping. Um, and no matter which way you're shipping it out, shipping alcohol is expensive. But when you just have two cans put in the mail, it, it's less. And so, so that that's helping make this sample program really, really accessible. And and we think it's pretty crazy that uh, <laughs> to join any wine club without having to taste it first. And none of these wine clubs online have a way to offer a tasting because of this giant shipping cost, yeah. problem yeah, and so sure. and so these little cans in the mail it we cover it we actually cover most of the shipping it's still not that cheap because shipping alcohol is is expensive but right. but with this program um we think it's really important that you get to try the wine before you join one of our wine clubs 
Um, and, and that's kind of our showing our, our confidence and in, in our belief in, in our product when we cover the majority of costs to get it over to you. And then it's up to you to see what you think. And yeah, I mean, and that's the best way to stand behind your brand is not to, you know, do discounts or have crazy things, but really be like, here, taste it. Would you like it now? You know, and if Samples people say the yes, biggest then, turtle yeah. the acquisition of a, of for a sure. customer. For and, sure. and that's what Evan and I can speak to personally, because, you know, we all have perceptions of boxed wine, myself included. You know, I mean, most of us, when we think of boxed wine, think of Franzia, right? We think of like the, how much is that? Like $12, maybe, for like you know, liters? something like that. Know. Um, you know, and there's a reason it's that cheap. It's not very delicious. It wouldn't be very like expensive it. if it was put into a glass bottle, but Either. it would be more per unit. Right, for sure. And so that perception exists in our in our world, you know, just like I think a nice parallel to that is cork versus screw cap. Oh yeah. Very right. True. Like I think that's a really great parallel that for a very long time everyone looked down their nose at screw cap and really thought that meant it was a low quality wine if there was a screw cap on it. Now there's a whole story we can tell about that, about you know why that happened initially and why that perception happened. And it's the same thing with boxed wine really, is that the cheaper wines kind of went there first and it was a different proposition. It wasn't about necessarily getting you high quality wine in a more environmentally friendly way and for cheaper. It was really, we have cheap wine and we wanna cut the margins even more and keep right. the profit for ourselves, right? It's a different value proposition. Yeah, I mean, a high quality piece of cork can cost upwards of like a dollar fifty just for the cork. So right. if you can remove that cost, you can make a cheaper glass and right. undercut your competitor, and that continues to tumble down. Right. And now we're at that phase where people understand that a screw cap works just as well as a cork, actually. And it does. And some of the high end bottles that have screw caps on them, you know, are starting to exist now. And so we're on that trajectory with boxed wine too. And all of you who are here are kind of on the leading edge of this You're change movement, the wave. you know, where we can all kind of help spread the word that, yeah, exactly, Danica, I love it. Um, where we can all help spread the word that like, yeah, absolutely, there's crap boxed wine out there, but there's crap bottle wine out there. There's also great, you know, um, boxed wine out there. And that's why I think the story of how we finished this so quickly is so compelling for us because we know that we drink a lot of really good wine and we're very spoiled in that way. And so the fact that we were choosing to drink this wine over the other very nice bottles of wine we have in our house, because we are people who will open a nice bottle on a Tuesday. Yeah. Um, you know, that really speaks to the quality of this wine. And I personally am not always the biggest Sauvignon Blanc fan. I find a lot of them to be very like bell peppery and just a little too acidic for me. And I probably like I was drinking the white almost every night and kind of mm -hmm. like, I like this Sauv Blanc. This is a really enjoyable Sauv Blanc. And then the Pinot as well. Um, yeah, actually, on that point, let's let's step aside because I do want to come back to like the the virtues of alternative packaging, like the cans and the bottles. But let's, uh, Jack, would you mind just chatting with us a little bit about this Sauvignon Blanc? Uh, presuming that you know, if people have both, they're probably starting with the white. Um, yeah. You know, who's making it? Where it's coming from? Stuff of that nature. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, one of the things that we like to uh, bring people's attention to about about this Sauvignon Blanc, it's it's a really nice it's a really nice product. Um, we we paid up in a, in our sourcing for it, and uh, that that makes me I want to I want to talk about how we do some of our sourcing. Um, we have uh, connections to basically hundreds and hundreds of of different high end wineries. Um, who really focus on the production side of things. Um, and so when we can access a huge marketplace of so many different producers, it really opens the door to certain sourcing opportunities that a lot of individual wineries can't have. And, and we use those opportunities to make great wine more accessible. So for instance, um, uh, let's see, a couple, la a couple of purchases ago, um, we worked with this rosé producer out of Napa. It, it, it was an outstanding Pinot Noir rosé. Um, I'd, I'd actually love to get some more, um, but, uh, they, they only sell to 
to very, very, very large brands, very large high-end brands. Um, but we had kind of an in and they had like 500, usually they only sell by the truckload, which is, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's like 2000 gallons is the minimum order. But they had an odd lot sitting in one of their tanks, which usually they'd have nothing to do with because all of their clients are large clients. We're a very small business. Um, we're national direct to consumer for the first time ever as of a couple of months ago. Um, but we had a small lot order that perfectly matched what they had left. So we got the benefits of having economies of scale, like these giant companies, we got the same price for this excellent product um, for a small lot. So that's like one kind of nuanced example of, of how we'll source an excellent product. Um, um, and, and that's one example. Now, this another part of our sourcing is an environmental requirement. Um, and we like to say we source grapes only from special natural environments. Um, and in the case of this uh, Sauvignon Blanc, it's it's really, really rad. So like if you if you get into like your geology shoes and think about geology and like um, you know, you're out on a hike and looking at all the different land and, and that kind of thing. Um, imagine you're in the, the mountains out in California, total wine country, okay? You're literally in Napa Valley. So in Napa Valley, there is proper, Napa Valley proper. And then within Napa Valley, there is subregions within it. So Napa Valley, Napa Valley, which is like the Napa Valley, is like in this like kind of nook, like this, it's, it's in this crevice that matches up to like San Pablo Bay. Um, and so the, the fog from the bay kind of rises off the bay, the, the kind of sea mist, and it just slowly kind of moves into the Napa Valley. Now, that, that's proper Napa Valley is right here. Childs Valley is where our Sauvignon Blanc is from. And it's a subregion of Napa Valley. So right over this mountain here is this little channel. It's this little pocket of like mountains. There's this fertile strip in between these mountains and the sea mist from the San Pablo Bay travels up that valley and kind of rolls off and just kind of settled into this little nook of mountains that are perfect for wine growing. And it's just completely ridiculous. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's just, it's a peach of a region, we like to say. <laughs> um, and that's where this Sauvignon Blanc comes from. Um, it's, it's a large part of why we sourced this product. And we, we got a great deal on it as well. And so we've kind of traversed much of the Sauvignon Blanc market, literally, and have found this excellent product that we want to share with everyone. And it's, you know, the experience of it um, is, is really clear. Um, and actually, Evan, you've got a good photo up there. I'm, I'm drinking mine out of a can, but you could show them how clear it actually is. In, yeah, in it really, like it almost, it almost could be mistaken as water. Like it's so light and like clear and pristine. Yeah, it's really got some incredible, uh, it, it, you know what, it's what, what I find neat about this Sauvignon Blanc is that it's got this kind of bright clarity and, and pristine is a perfectly great word for it but it's not one dimensional. There's, there's complexity, especially on the texture of the palate. And I think that is because the acidity isn't overwhelming yeah. and getting the morning sunlight like they do in Charles Valley without the heat, given the location of Charles Valley and you've got um, the, the blocking of the, you know, the intense afternoon heat means that this isn't getting overripe, but mm -hmm. it's also not like, it's not lacking in ripeness. Um, it, it's, it, I've had a few from Charles Valley and 
this is a really fun wine. Uh, if anybody, to Suzanne's point earlier, doesn't think they like Sauvignon Blanc, this is a really great one to change your mind. Yeah, because I'm very picky about Sauvignon Blanc. I would say 80% of Sauvignon Blancs I try, I'm like, meh, not for me. Yeah. I'm okay. Um, and this one, I, I can drink on the regular. Yeah. Um, and actually kind of like crave it and be like, I want a glass of that Sauvignon Blanc. I personally think it's my favorite white wine. I, I mean, we've up. sourced a number of different white wines over the years. We actually used to uh, do wine for events. Uh, we used to bring wine to, you know, 50,000 people music festivals where we not just beat the wine sales records there, but but we doubled them outright in, in three years. And, and that's the way people are responding to when great wine is, is made more accessible because a lot of people haven't even tried great wine. And it's like this new thing where it's like, oh, wait a minute, that's actually really good. But yeah. anyway, that's what we used to do at events. And, and we've, done a, we've, we've done a Chardonnay. Um, we've done a, I think we actually did a Sauvignon Blanc a couple years ago, but, but to date, the, this Sauvignon Blanc is my, so is my favorite white wine. Everyone's palate is different. Totally. But for me, this one just kind of rings a bell. Yeah, for sure. Hey, does anyone have any questions or comments? I want to make sure we make room for people to unmute themselves and jump in here. I We've did been so have, excited that we just keep talking. I know. We did have a question come in on the chat while people are deciding if they want to unmute themselves. Um, someone kind of chimed in and asked me about how long the box will last in the fridge, both open and unopened. So if it's a completely sealed box, you have to worry about it at all. Um, but then once you open it and you start taking wine out of it, how long will it last? And should you keep it in the fridge even if it's red wine? Um, so, I mean, before you open it, you're, I mean, it's just, it's cool in the fridge. It's, it's, it's good. Those, those, the bags that actually, the, the materials that constitute the bags are actually part uh of the same material that all of the wine is fermented in, in, in stainless steel tanks. So mm -hmm. like this bag is like super secure and you don't have the oxidation of a cork, um, especially with white wine, that kind of matters. Um, but uh, you, it, it just, and if there's no oxidation, there's no aging. There's no, and, there's no aging of it. And white right. wine and rosés are typically better uh, young, but, and if it's unopened, you probably don't even need to keep it in the fridge, right? If it's unopened, as long as you're keeping it in a stable temperature and it's not getting hot and cold and hot and cold, mm -hmm. it's probably fine in your cupboard or, or something like that. Sure. Um, I like to keep my white wine in the fridge or in my wine cooler just so I have it ready. Um, sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> um, to, to our point earlier, as soon as this is empty, you don't know it's going to be empty, so you have no anticipation to have the next one ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you just get to do your thing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we definitely kept both. Once we opened these, we kept both the red and the white in the fridge. Um, but we also are big believers that red wines can be drank a little colder than most people do. Um, so we really like to kind of pour our glass of red wine out of the fridge, leave it there for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then we feel like that's perfect temperature to drink it at. Yeah. So um, we're, we're cool with that as well. Yeah. Um, and then after you open it, um, you know, it, it's good. It's good for weeks. Um, and there's only two bottles in there. So, you know, it's not, mean, that, it's not that hard to, to gauntlet yeah. has been <laughs> yeah. to go. Like I said, we went through ours ways too fast. So you'll be fine before it goes bad, but it is really nice too. You know, I feel like a lot of people live in households where, you know, one person really likes white. The other person really likes red. Um, you don't want to open a whole bottle for the both for one person, that kind of stuff. So it's really nice for that too. Yeah, um, very much so. Or just like you want your cooking wine while you're cooking and like have a, something to sip on while before your like meal's ready. Yeah, you know, this is really something neat too. I, I feel like because of the cost savings of this type of packaging, both of these wines, despite being, you know, four boxed wine, not something that is inexpensive, um, but they punch well above their weight class. I mean, both of these yeah, the are, sure. I think, at least, I would say at least 30% more in terms of what I would expect to pay for by this quality of wine yeah. if I were purchasing it by the bottle. Yeah, because you Look, don't have Evan, the I'm, glass I'm so, or, the fork or the label or any of that. Evan, I'm so stoked to hear you say that um, because 
that's what we're really trying to communicate with, with the products we're making. Um, and I, I also want to call attention to like, we're a really, really small business and like, we're able to, we're able to do that still. Um, Goodness and, to you, sir. Yeah. yeah. And cheers back. I'm just really stoked to, to hear you um, uh, appreciate and, and value it the way we're intending it to be appreciated and valued. Yeah. Um, and it well, sounds and it's like a hard a balance great... to, to walk as well, because I feel like there's the perception that boxed wine is cheap and low quality, and therefore people expect it to be cheap financially, but then they also want it to be higher quality. But when a boxed wine costs more money, it makes them be like, that's too expensive for boxed wine. So there's this weird dichotomy that we have to work as marketers and as you know consumers and as enthusiasts to help wrap our minds around about like, boxed wine shouldn't be $10 for a box because you're not going to like the wine if it is. And if you pay this much for it, that's still a really amazing value. And like, so helping people do that value proposition and understanding that like it drinks above its weight class yeah. is an important part of the education, I think that needs to kind of happen. And I think that, uh, you know, Jack, your, your decision um, it, with the business, and I imagine a lot of it was a, a kind of a conscientious pivot, especially when events no longer were an option, to go to the direct consumer route was a really wise one because in the, you know, in the realm of your webpage where someone is going to find it and make the decision to purchase it, you can explain all this a lot more readily than someone walking by it on a shelf at the grocery store. And they're like, you know, For sure. look at this boxed wine. Look how expensive this boxed wine is and completely miss the point. Maybe be, you know, curious, perhaps. But I think by and large, the people that are going to the boxed wine section are going there for a reason other than. And so getting people on board the way you are you know, in a, on a, you know, individual basis kind of as they come to the website and as we're, you know, in, in attempting to do tonight um, is, a, yeah. is a great way to have advocates and ambassadors out there uh, for unit. Yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. Um, it, we do understand that kind of education is our problem. Um, a lot, everyone else on the market has different problems. Um, totally. our, ours is education. But, but it, that's a challenge that we totally accept um, for, for several, re several reasons. Um, one, one, is a tr one is the trade-offs and advantages of the formats like we talked about earlier. The other is how much more environmental it is. Um, when, you remove, when you remove glass from wine, you not, you not only make it much, much more cost-effective in terms of production costs and shipping costs, but you make it way more environmental. It's like such a no brainer um, in, in so many ways. Um, it, 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 it was kind of like a, but, but here we, so that's our advantages, that's our strengths. But then we have this big challenge of education. And, and I think you did a great job summing it up um, where people are in the box wine aisle, they look at Franzia, they look at, you know, black box and, and that's what they normally get to the box wine aisle for because there's been no company with enough, you know, I don't know, courage to get out there and try to make this change to everybody's benefit. But wow. we but we have an education problem. And I, I'd never quite thought about it the way you mentioned it with this direct to consumer channel having a better opportunity to educate. And, yeah. and you're totally right. It's a brand new channel for us, but that's that's an interesting insight that that yeah. I hadn't heard before. Well, yeah. and the other challenge too is people who really appreciate good wine and are looking for good value, good wine, are not in the boxed wine aisle. Very you know, true. so that's the other challenge is getting you know where where your shelves even where people find this right like right. that's always a challenge as well as like getting so this, the online format is helpful in that regard as well getting this product next to comparably priced wine yeah. is a you know that's basically an impossibility in the current understanding and the mindset of you know most retailers they're just not going to do that regardless of what you're what you're priced at and and i think that you know personally the angle of environmental uh, impact is one that I'm I'm really drawn to. I really appreciate that. Um, and just a couple of facts that I uh, became aware of recently is 
we decided to, to feature unit and, and talk about box wine. Um, the environmental impact, the, the pounds of carbon dioxide that are um, offset by having something in a box as opposed to in a glass is roughly half in terms of shipping costs and the production of actually glass, making, the, making glass the glass bottle glass. itself, no. roughly half. Um, additionally, the landfill capacity is also roughly half for the same volume of wine that you get to consume, the amount of landfill space that you take up if you've got boxed wine. And it recycle, like, because a lot of people are like, well, both are recyclable, so what's the big deal, right? Both but the are, energy cost to recycle is right. far greater. For and that. honestly, both aren't recyclable kind of everywhere, you know? I mean, some people take back cans and bottles for the deposit, sure. but cardboard is one of the most unequivocally Almost recyclable everywhere. things yeah. everywhere, whereas glass can still be tricky some places. On that note, yeah, I'd like to... Yeah, go ahead. I have a couple of remarks. First off, just want to say on a personal note, the nose on this Sauv Blanc is among the most striking I have encountered on a Sauv Blanc. It's nice. magnificent and it delivers on the palate. So it's not a promise breaker as so many are. Um, um, now, I, I think it's worth pointing out here, we'd be talking about price, but uh, we're not talking about price. Uh, and we've got 35 people online right now who have either already purchased it or yeah. are predisposed to purchase it, uh, particularly after tonight's presentation. <laughs> Can we talk price point? Someone goes to the website, they want to buy the Pinot Noir or the Sauv Blanc or a combination. Can you talk to us about what, what they're looking at? Um, so I, uh, so what's like the actual question? price points, I think. Yeah, your price points. I realize point. it's, going to be, it's going to vary by state, but sure. Or maybe okay. not, since you're, you're distributing centrally. Yeah, yeah. So it boils down. We're offering wine clubs right now. And right now, our wine shop is only accessible for wine club members, um, which we think is great. Um, but uh, it boils down the, the lowest commitment uh, wine club boils down to about $32 a bottle. Um, and so, you know, that includes shipping. So, so there's no trip to the store. There's no, you know, trip out to Napa to find a wine you like and sample a hundred wines, um, because you can sample it for $14 and have it put on your door. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so you're really looking at no risk. Like all of these things are just great wine, more accessible, but in terms of price, you're looking at about $32 a bottle. If you go, if you upgrade to our, uh, from the corner piece membership to the jigsaw piece membership, uh, you're looking at some pretty solid uh, savings, even on top of the, of the corner piece membership. Um, mm -hmm. We pay for the majority of shipping um, in, in every club. Um, and, and that's another thing that we offer, but shipping included, we like to include the shipping in the bottle pricing um, because, you know, that no one wants to pay shipping. Um, everyone's living, we're, we're all living in the Amazon prime world and no one's paying any shipping. And so we include it in our bottle price. So you don't have to worry about it and you get it on your doorstep for about 32 bucks a bottle. Speaking of jigsaw pieces, I'm looking at your logo over your left shoulder there. Yeah. Can, yeah. can you talk to us about the jigsaw piece? Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so unit means a whole greater than the sum of its parts. Um, if it were like mathematically represented, it'd be one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. um, and we use puzzle pieces to illustrate that concept. Um, a, like a pile of puzzle pieces is a mess, but all clicked in, it, it's more than just the individual pieces. And there's, there's many, I've got an example right here tonight where we are right now. We've got 35 people in here from all over the country. We're all drinking wine together and we're doing something fun for our Thursday night. Like something fun for a change um, in this time where we can't connect with anyone. We, we, we can't all get together, but yet here we are. And so like, that's one example of what bringing people together can do. Um, it, it's something that 
you know, we've been able to make a good time out of on, on just a Thursday night. Um, and it's actually something that we've been thinking about adding to our to our wine clubs, which I think will develop over the next couple months here, but it, it's a new channel. But anyway, that's one example of the concept. And another way to say it is uh, it's a, I'm sure everyone's heard of a festival or a tra I'm sure everyone's heard of a tragedy of the commons where, you know, everyone shares one garden and then all of a sudden you're out of crops and there, you know, you're stuck waiting. That would be a tragedy of the commons. But unit stands for what would be a festival of the commons. When there's more people added to it, everyone is better off. And one way to illustrate that is the more people that we get on board, the more the the less air pollution there is happening out there. The less non-biodegradable glass forever um, is in landfills. And the <laughs> It just gives us an, an opportunity to source more excellent, great wines for you and be able to do things like offer customizable clubs um, and, and kind of just fun little details that, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless, um, which we can provide you. One of my favorite current little details like that is the things on our, our six pack. Um, this is a six pack here, which is like super sturdy. You could like, you could have like two people like piggybacking on each other, standing on these and they would hold up. These, they're that solid. They're just that kind of perfectly packaged. But um, on the front of them, I don't know if we'll do this again because uh, it just ended up costing us a little, a little more <laughs> than we thought. But these, these little uh, stickers here are, they fit, they're, they're hand placed stickers into these so I don't know if we'll do those again. They might be like a collector's thing in the end. I don't, I don't know. But they, they represent wine, the white wines in, in our clubs. Um, and cool. and here, here's where the piece kind of fits into it. The, the, the red wine, the, the Pinot Noir we offer, has this other shape, and it's hand-placed right in there. And, it, and, it, and it's this one here. This one's going to represent the red wines. And the other pieces, I'm going to leave a mystery right now because we haven't <laughs> released them yet. But it's just kind of a fun thing. And I'll, and I'll leave it to you guys what you think they might be. But it's just kind of a fun thing that we can do. And it kind of highlights some of the fun stuff we can do with the, the creativity if we have the chance to expand it and that kind of thing, um, which ultimately really ends up with better products for everybody. Yeah, I love that. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about your story and where this idea came from and why you're doing this and maybe a little bit about your background too. Like give us the kind of brand origin story of Unit Wines. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I was an economics major in college. I could have almost had- Hey, I was too. You're yes. economics? Econ nerds. Yes. I, I, you know, you don't, you don't see many women in, in economics. There's like a small handful in every, every class. So no. I respect that. I think it's rad. Um, yeah, Except that I realized I couldn't major. really do anything with my econ degree, like maybe you did too. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. Um, it does. It does have application to markets. And yeah. in college okay. at CU Boulder, I I wanted to be a trader. Um, and so right out of college, I got a job on Wall Street, and I was a trader for a year and a half. Cool. And I I quit and went surfing in Australia for three months. So. I like to say it's kind of a story of corporate departure. Um, and so I, I got to Australia, I, I surfed my brains out every day. And by the end of it, um, I was ready to get back to work and I decided to start a, a, a wine company. We used to have really awesome college house parties um, in college. And, and I was inspired by that. And I was like, oh, I could probably sell wine. And this was a long time ago. And, and since then, the inspiration is the, is the same, it's just mature. Um, really, what was the most awesome thing about house parties was the sense of community. And when you get out of college, it's, it's largely missing, that sense of community, so 
where you're meeting new people through other people. There's a lot of just banter and just goofiness all happening with regularity. Like there's so many beautiful things that can happen with community. And I found it to be largely missing after college. And so I wanted to build a platform to to reinvigorate, rebuild, and, and foster community. And wine is a excellent thing for that. And so is great food. And those things go together really well. And when you have a great food and a great wine together, you've really got something that's just literally going to make you friends if you want, or make the friends you already have stoked. I mean, it's just really simple equation. Um, and then as the night goes on, it, it just gets easier and easier. Um, but anyway, that, that I, that's how the company kind of started. Um, why and, wine, Jack? Like, what's that? Why wine? Why not beer or spirits or anything else? Were you like really into wine or what was the wine piece of it? Um, so when I was in Australia, the, uh, the most inexpensive way to drink alcohol was wine. And down there, they call it goon. Um, and, and it's because the taxes and the import levies and all this stuff. And I mean, the exchange rate. Australia um, is notorious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it was really expensive to drink alcohol. And the reason everyone drank wine was because putting wine in a box was the most cost effective way to have a nice drink. Um, and at that time, eight or nine years ago now, no one back home was selling it other than, um, you know, Franzia and, and Bella. And, and that was like a long time ago. And, and it's, it's super crazy, but still no really great wines are, are put into a box or a very small amount. And, and I understand it's, it, you know, there's a big hurdle here about education that we accept, but that, that was kind of, it just made sense to me. I, yeah. I just felt like I could make a business difference for people. And it, so and it is just, boxed wine much more prevalent in Australia? Is that kind of what you're saying? That they have, yeah, they do have more there? Definitely. Huh, and, I didn't know that. Clean and buying that well product and, and Buying that product and having it just with regularity on tap in your fridge, it was just like so obvious cool. and, and so environmental. And it's it was, really neat that Australia has kind of led the way both in the boxed wine arena, you know, more recently and in the screw cap arena, yeah. you know, 30 years ago. They, they were really the first country pretty closely alongside with New Zealand to industry wide just make that shift and say, we're not using cork anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah so no wonder that they also got on board with uh, with box with wine. box wine earlier than we have. Um, I just wanted to uh, offer the opportunity, Jack, for you to speak briefly about a really cool program that I know you guys are a part of, 1% uh, for the Planet. Yeah, we love that program. Yeah, um, so we joined 1% 1 1 for the Planet when we launched this channel and we, and we were building these products. We actually, if you look on the cans, you'll you'll see it on there. And if you look on the six packs, you'll see it on there and all the new products, it's on there as well. So this was really part of our whole new thing. And it, and it was this, it wasn't just like this, this marketing thing that we just strapped on at the end and just, no, it was like, and, and there's a reason for that. And it's because we've supplied wines for, to Telluride Bluegrass Festival for the last three years where we've doubled all those records and everything. And they're, they're one of the, uh, they're one of the first like all green, no waste festivals. Like they have no waste from that thing being like 50,000 people in the mountains. Like it's really wild. It's super rad. All of our recyclable waste for like 25, 2,500 bottles of wine for one weekend boils down to it can all of the recyclable waste can fit into a cardboard box and and that really highlights some of the environmental stuff it like it's a 99 percent reduction in waste weight so like that's part of our origin story too because that's where we really first found traction for these products at, at events we we also sell wine in a nine liter format and in these barrels here, I don't know if you can see this, 
but uh these barrels it's it's portable wine on tap so oh. so our nine liter format loads and reloads into there in about 20 seconds so you can bring wine on tap to areas that would never otherwise have it and we think that's a way to make great wine more accessible because you get the advantages of having wine on tap um at a place in the middle of the mountains which is like six hours away from seemingly anywhere and here you are just pouring great wine on tap that's and cool. so that's really part of our origin story and environmental stuff was so important to them um it it kind of it kind of just transferred over it always kind of resonated with me but that really drove the nail home and that's a big part of why we joined one percent for the planet and what that means is we donate one percent of our revenues not not profits one percent of our revenues to environmental nonprofits, and it's certified by one percent for the planet um there's a it, it right now there's a, i think like 3800 uh different businesses who who work with them um but it's to us it was a way to just kind of uh, it was a good way to highlight some of our practices that were already happening um, and a way to add to those benefits as well. Yeah, it, it, I think it's just a profoundly remarkable program. Um, I have a very close friend that uh, runs um, a community kind of outreach program in Nicaragua that is uh, focused primarily on teaching people about uh, single use plastic and how to be better stewards of the environment because especially in third world countries, that awareness is almost non-existent. Um, and so it's a, really, it's a really great program that I think um, you know, everybody should know more about. And kudos to you, Jack, for being a member. Uh, a couple and other questions. Kudos for Sarah for being here. They're, they're 1% for the Planet account manager. Oh, oh hi, well. Sarah. So, sure. Sarah. We didn't even hi, know, everybody. Didn't even know that. And we're giving you a shout I've, out. Sarah, please I've been here. I've... About 1% for the Planet. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the moment. Just a short minute. I've been here. I've been um, multitasking and cooking my dinner at the same no time. So, but super happy to have the company in the background. And I've learned so much, not only about, well, I knew about unit, of course, and talking to Jack, but learns more about, um, you know, how they're curating and getting their, their um, grapes for sale and everything like that. So yeah, 1% for the planet, just as Jack described it. Perfect job. Way to go, Jack. Gold star. Um, and uh, that's great that Suzanne, you said you're um, familiar with the program, so that's yeah. even better. And we really, our, our impact is about con connecting dollars to doers. And we really believe in the power of collaborative effort. When Yvonne Chenard and Craig Matthews started it, they really did believe and still believe it's uh, vital to our success that everybody can contribute something. Some can contribute more than others. And that's where the business membership model comes in for businesses, like Jack said, to contribute from that sales line is really important. And that third party verification that we provide, we'll be checking on that. We check on every business's commitment to the 1% and it's across the board, it's an accountability factor. So. We're really glad to see small businesses come in because actually 60% of our membership, those uh, 3,800 business members that Jack quoted, about 60% of our businesses are small businesses. So it's really inspiring to see startups, you know, people who are pre-product, pre-revenue even, they join because they know it's the right thing to do and they want their company to stand for that. And so we just want to applaud Unit Wines and I haven't gotten to try it yet, but I will very soon, I'm sure. And uh, really thank you for hosting this tonight and wish you all the success. Yay, thanks for being here, Sarah. We really Here's appreciate Sarah. it. So we have a few questions rolling in in the chat here. People are starting to get chatty as they drink their wine, which is a lot. Big surprise, big surprise. Go figure. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. Um, so we had a question, are you available in stores at all or is it only online right now? Um, so in the past, we've been in some retail stores, um, but we've really pulled away from, from that channel. Um, we're, we're a small business right now. Um, and we have to focus our energies where, where we think it's, it's right. Um, and this is the only platform, like Evan was kind of mentioning earlier that we have the platform to show people what's really going on here because when people show up in a retail aisle and they see a brown cardboard box, yeah. like it just doesn't make any sense. Like 
I was thinking about a thing earlier today and I was kind of laughing. It's like, like brown is green. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, we're, we're kind of we're kind of lightening up on that while we put a, a lot of our energies into the direct to consumer channel. Sure. Um, so right now it's pretty much available online. Um, when things open back up again, we may be in, I mean, we're in a really cool, hip kind of uh, burrito place in Golden. We're at this, I mean, we're, we're at a couple places here in Colorado. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, I know we have a, a national group here. Um, and so right now, online, online's the only thing. Um, oh. we, we'd love to grow to, to get to the point. We do actually have the legal framework to be able to supply um, large, large retail. Um, so, you know, the possibility okay. there. So, yeah. so go in and tell your, tell your retail store, tell them like, <laughs> hey, I, I wanna be able to get this wine or probably a lot simpler, just head over to unit.com. Right. Especially it, since you guys cover most of the shipping. So it's like- Now here's a question, another question similar though, do you cover the shipping costs on that large barrel? And is that available <laughs> for purchase? Um, we actually don't, uh, we get this question all the time. I'm we sure. actually don't offer the barrel to, to just anyone. Um, I'm still building these in my garage. Oh man. And so, you know, I, I have only so much time. And, and so we have, we have a number of barrels and we place them where they go through a lot of wine. Um, that's another one of those things, you know, if we, grow to be, you know, a, a larger business. That's one thing that we might be able to, to provide people. Um, I think but, that uh, could be a really fun um, club member reward, like a club member of the year reward where it's like, you know, how much wine are you buying? Do you need a barrel for yourself yet? Like that could be a fun reward system or incentive. Yeah. And, and these, these big ones are for, um, big events. Like, like I said earlier, like big wedding, we've done a bunch of weddings, uh, you know, 50,000 people, music festivals, like big events. We want to make like, uh, like a little barrel, like a mini barrel that can fit on your countertop. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, that'd be and cool. the other awesome thing about these is you can just put ice packs in there. So if you're doing rosés or whites, then you, then you just throw ice packs. You have no leaking to worry about because it's in the ice pack. And then you have like cold white wine on tap. Perfect. Like, we'd love to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, and then one last question. That's actually a great segue to this next question. Um, we've got Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir here. I know you mentioned Rosé earlier. What else is on the horizon? And yeah, what, what else do you have what, in your current portfolio? Give of us offerings? a sneak peek. What's coming up or what's, yeah. All right, so we've got uh, our last production run. We split the quantities between our wholesale channel here in Colorado and our direct to consumer online channel. Um, we did that, and actually, what started the whole production run in the first place is we got this wedding client who was going to do 300 weddings a year, and he was going to make our wines his primary offering at all the events because of all the benefits of portable wine on tap. And, and everyone just loves these barrels. And so th they were going to make our wines at 300 weddings a year. And then the you know, mess were all in happened. And so we just were like, okay, we're gonna split, we're gonna split the the quantities, half here, half there. Now, right now, you know, there's no events going on and, and none of the bars and restaurants have anyone in them. And so our wholesale channel, like it's yeah. it's not it's not moving product right now. And and here we are with 35 people online um, who now even get to know about these products. Um, and it's just a big difference. And so what might happen is we might move our wine allotted for our event channel and move it to our direct to consumer channel. And what that means is we would have a replenishment of the Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, but we would also have our Sangiovese, our 2016 Paso Sangiovese and our 2017 Yolo County Chardonnay. Ooh, um, cool. Cool. Oh, we don't have cans in those formats we only have 1.5 liters um so that would probably be the next the next uh available here on on the horizon but 
moving forward into the future, we want to know what our club members think. We want to know what our club members like. We want to know, we want to co-op with our members to do all the hard work of finding the best product at the best price and looking at all these producers and going into all that research. We want to co-op with our, with our members and, and really get them what they want. And so that's what we're here to do. And we're here to make it fun and fine also. And so that's a little bit of trajectory about where we might be cool. headed. And there is a, another question, especially as we're talking about different wines, um, where are you making your wine? Is each wine being made at a different vineyard and kind of it's different or a different winery or what, where is it being made? Yeah, so we, we contract with different producers to produce for our brand. Um, and so wine gets produced on their site and then it gets sim uh, shipped to our uh, packing facility where we kind of finish it, where we add uh, stabilization uh, stuff. Uh, in the case of the white wine and more, more in the white wine than in the red wine, but we, we add um, uh, like bubble, we add the smallest amount of bubbles. I can't remember which, it's all chemistry, um, but we add, we add the thing that makes the bubbles in all, all the drinks and we do that so that when you ship these products, they're like, they're like pressed, you know, they're, they're sturdy. They hold up, yeah. the cans are mm -hmm. solid. And then also it kind of just livens up the wines, just that, that little bit. Um, so if you really pay attention when, when you're sipping these wines, you can actually feel a little bit of the effervescence on, on your tongue. Um, and it's something that I really like about these products. Um, but, but it's, it's there for, for reasons. So we do that. We do, we do a cross flow filtration. We, it's actually double filtered. We do a cross flow, flow filtration, which is this big machine that has a bunch of these little tiny straws and all these like big tubes. So, so all the wine like goes through that and it removes the sediment. And um, it's just a way to kind of filter the wine. And then there's a, um, a sterile filtration, which has a, a, it's just kind of like a, a wall of filter. And then like only the, there's like a, I forget, I forget what micron level, <laughs> you know, but like it's Very double small. filtered. And so it's really clean. Um, and that, then that would be, bottle, that would be micron bottle. economics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well done, Philip. Nice, nice. Funny, <laughs> funny. Yeah. So there's a degree, there's a degree of aeration in all of the wines. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's carbon dioxide that they, that they do um, to do that. And then it goes through those filters and then it goes right into the cans um, and then it's sealed up um, and, and it, and it lasts in there. Um, it, it lasts just the same as, as glass. Um, and it's, it's just, it's solid. Um, yeah, Jack, one of the things I, I, I understand about like a kind of a flash carbonation to, to a very slight degree that make like a, almost like something that's mildly petalant uh, using usually stone carbonating techniques is that process of introducing carbon dioxide and actually having it dissolve into the liquid mm -hmm. creates carbonic acid, which is a preservative. So it's probably something that is similarly aligned with um, any kind of other stabilizers that you're using, to my understanding. Mm -hmm. That that's uh, new information to me, and that's really cool to hear. But yeah, it's right in line with the rest of the things that we do. Um, and and part of that is is we want it to get to everyone's doorstep the same way that it is in the winery. And so we want to preserve that that flavor and that quality as much as possible. And everything that we do in in that process is is toward that end. So I know we're coming up, up past the hour here um, and I wanna be sensitive to everyone's evening and time. I just threw a, a poll up to, to get your opinions on things at the end here as well. But if anyone has any last questions, thoughts, um, I don't feel like we talked about the Pinot quite enough. Do you want to talk about I mean, the, what you, your thoughts on the Pinot? We waxed poetic about the Sauvignon. We did, and I think we're remiss on, on I agree. omitting some discussion of this Pinot because I tell you what, Pinot is a, an incredibly fickle grape to grow. Very finicky. It's not an easy product to make. And as a result, 
the cheap pinots that you might find out in the store are probably best avoided. Um, pinot is definitely one of those grapes, like it behooves you to spend a little more on it, I feel like. But this is a really refreshing contrast to the necessity of spending, you know, fifty dollars or eighty dollars on a bottle, you know, on yeah. a bottle of perfectly delicious Pinot. And I think it's because, again, there's not that extra cost that you have when yeah. you're buying a bottle. The packaging yeah. cost. You, you can know, invest more of the money that, in the wine where it belongs. Right. That's what we want to be paying for. We don't want to pay for the marketing and the, all that. We want to pay for the wine. And this comes from an area that I honestly don't really strongly associate with Pinot. And yeah. I feel like the next time Oxford. I head out to Sar Sacramento, I'm going to have to take a closer look at uh, some Pinots in Yolo County and, and around Clarksburg because this is mighty fine. The one, the one thing that we think is great about Clarksburg is that it's... Uh, they say it's the gem of the Delta. And on the front of, on the front of the boxes here, if you open up, it, it has a little blurb about where the grapes come from oh. on, on all of our six packs. Um, but Clarksburg, we think is pretty rad because it has that same maritime influence. We like to source with that maritime influence. Um, and in the Clarksburg, region um it there's a delta and so there's all these little fingering fingerling kind of rivers that um are, are out there and and so you get that kind of rising of, of fog off of the off of the maritime influence there and and that lends to the moisture of the region which we believe is a great way to source grapes and it's also really fun and it gives us a platform to talk about um the cool environments that that these wines come from and so you you get a little bit about each region that is specifically chosen um where each wine comes from and and that's a little bit about um clarksburg and there's a little bit more on the on the boxes as well very cool i'd love to see and i think suzanne put this in the chat I said Zinfandel. I don't know if you noticed, Jack, but we were we were, we were all kind of voting the audience. on what we wanted the next unit wine to be. I said <laughs> Zinfandel. Suzanne said dry Riesling, and I have had some lovely Rieslings from Clarksburg. That would be really cool to see too. Yeah, I love to hear it. I I'll be excited to see what that poll says. Wow, there's 47 chats. That's pretty cool. Yep, we're we're chatting away over here. Any <laughs> final questions from anyone? Anyone want to unmute themselves and just chit chat a little bit and Tell your thoughts, comments, anything? Well, I think the Pinot, like, that's definitely my favorite. But, I mean, will you guys do a blend? Just out of curiosity. I mean, we drink a lot of blends. I don't know, I don't know if that's the thing. But. Um, so, uh, okay. So, you you totally got on to something there. And um, it was going to be a secret. But since you just totally bullseyed that, that's going to be one of the other uh, heart pieces. It's going to be blend. Cool. Okay. Well, look at the, you. You figured out part of the puzzle, man. <laughs> High five. You literally figured you literally. out part of literally part of the puzzle. <laughs> you get a barrel. No. <laughs> you get a barrel. And you get oh, a barrel. Wait, right? we get a barrel? Oh, that's. <laughs> yes. Everyone look under your seats. Everyone look under your seat. That's right. Who has the ticket? <laughs> Yeah, Any we'll, we'll do some blends. And one cool thing about blends is that you can often get some really nice blends uh, for for less than you would a, a pure kind of varietal. Um, and so that's actually a great way to make great wine more accessible. Um, so it's definitely on our radar. It's definitely one of the things we're going to be looking at on our next runs because we haven't released one yet and we'll be excited to do that. So um, yeah, throw it, throw in the chat, any kind of ideas or, or preferences that you might have and, you know, we'll weigh it in there. All right. Well, we're throwing in the chat right now. We have lots of other great virtual tastings coming up as well. Jack, thank you so much for being here and educating all of us about how good box wine can be and canned wine too, for that matter. And thanks for taking the, the leap in creating something that I think is such a vital need for wine lovers out there that are also aware of you know the hurdles that are that are there because of the packaging that everyone feels like they have to use 
it's really, I think it, it's such an important thing to be able to create an understanding and create an opportunity for understanding via the product itself, wherein people that care about the environment, but also want to drink good wine can have both. Yeah, um, it's been absolutely my pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you so much for hosting me, um, Evan, Suzanne, and, and Philip. Um, this is our first time doing this kind of thing. And it's been quite a journey to go 100 to zero in events and then try to go zero to 100 here online. And you guys have really helped us um, you know, get the word out here. And um, we really think it's something that can bring value to everyone who likes great wine. And um, I'm, I'm honored to, to have been here. Um, I've had a great time with all of you. And um, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just grateful. Awesome. Well, we are grateful for you and this delicious wine as well. And for all of you who joined us tonight. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. We hope to end for the Center for Culinary Culture, who is everyone's cheers sponsoring this with us. Philip, thank you for sponsoring these with us and bringing in Absolutely. your great expertise from the Center for Culinary Culture as well. We love that partnership. Um, and speaking of that partnership, we have a couple of great events coming up with Philip as well in January, just when it's getting cold and we all need some warming from the inside. Um, we have an all about rye whiskey tasting with Catoctin Creek from Virginia. There's a great little sampler pack. Speaking of samplers, uh, they're very smart, just like Jack. They have this great little trio sampler pack of three of their different rye whiskeys. they are 200 mil bottles, so a little more affordable than kind of going on the big guys. So awesome holiday gift, as is a subscription to this is an awesome holiday gift as well. Yeah, honestly. I tell you what, man, uh, that nine liter, <laughs> you might need a separate fridge, fridge for it, but the cost savings on that, that are has even to be better. amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have that in January. I threw the link in the chat for anyone who wants mm -hmm. to join. And then in February, we have a great grape spirits in February. Um, and so we're going to be doing a Pisco tasting and a grappa tasting. And so if you're not that familiar with Pisco or grappa, that's a really fun one with two really great brands, Pisco Lohia and Jermaine Roban. Um, and so we're going to be doing that as well. So for the spirits. And I might add, I might add here, we're going to be talking with Ansley Cole. That's who, right, if, Ansley if, Cole. If, if you can point to one person who's responsible for the Renaissance in California brandy, um, it's yeah. Ansley. So. Yeah, for sure. He's a pretty big legend in the spirits industry. Um, so if you're a spirits enthusiast, you don't want to miss that. And if you have spirits enthusiasts on your holiday gifts, you know, they all have plenty of bottles of whiskey, plenty of bottles of rum, all the vodka, gin. They probably don't have a lot of Pisco and Grappa though. So that can be a fun kind of gift for your spirits lover. And, and then you get to say, not only is this a gift, but come to this event with me too. And learn from the creator himself. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, yeah. those are a lot of fun. And, and if there are one, spirits- One quick spirits thing, wine. Evan, that you mentioned there with the, with the nine liter, you're totally right. It is a ridiculous cost savings because you're eliminating to, for the nine liter, you're limit, that's what we do for our, our events. That's how we make great wine accessible at events. And that's where we started. We started there because we could make great wine the most accessible there. And we like to say that's our run phase. We like to say our cans are our walk phase. We <laughs> like to say our 1.5 liter is our walk phase. And then our nine liter is our run phase. So, <laughs> If you want great wine, super accessible, you're having a block party, you're having a wedding, you, you know, you name it. Great wine is the most accessible in our nine liter format. Um, I think I only put three or four in our online channel that are even available, but shoot me a message and we might be able to work something out, especially when we move product over that channel. But I just wanted to yeah. add, piggyback. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that a little bit more because I need just, I did just throw that out there, but yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. Sure. Well, everyone enjoy your thirsty Thursday. Hopefully we helped you with your thirstiness a little bit here. Um, and we hope to see you all soon at future Crafty Cask events and, you know, supporting UNIT and the Center for Culinary Culture as well. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so Cheers. much. Cheers, everyone. Cheers to a fun time in 2020, right? Oh, exactly. thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually one more thing, Jack. Just a suggestion for the blend. All right. I don't really know what you're planning on using, but if you end up using Bordeaux blends, can you call it Card Bordeaux, please? <laughs> Card Bordeaux. Funny. 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 Funny.
Cheers. Cheers to that. Cheers, everyone. Have Cheers, a great guys. night. Good night. Happy holidays. <laughs>